Krishnamurti, it may be that this morning I will have only one question, which uh, in one way or another I'll be coming back to in various ways. In your writings, in your speaking, time and again you come back to this uh, wonderful little word, uh, lucid and lucidity. But is it possible, living as we are in this confused and confusing world, uh, torn by conflicting voices without and conflicting passions within, uh, with hearts that seem star-crossed and tensions that never go. Is it possible in such a life, in such a world, to live with total lucidity? And if so, how? I wonder, sir, what you mean by that word, lucid. I wonder whether you mean clarity. That's what first comes to mind, yeah. yes. Is it, is this clarity <coughs> a matter of intellectual perception or is it a perception with your whole being, not merely a fragment of your being, but with the totality of one's own being? It certainly has the ring of the latter, it's the latter. But... So it is not fragmentary, therefore it's not intellectual or emotional or sentimental. And so, is it possible in this confused world with so many contradictions and such misery and starvation, not only outwardly but also inwardly, such insufficiency psychologically, outwardly there are so many rich societies. Is it at all possible for a human being living in this world to find within himself a clarity that is constant, that is true in the sense, not contradictory. Is it possible for a human being to find it? That's my question. Your question. I don't see why not. I don't see why it shouldn't be found by anybody who is really quite serious. Most of us are not serious at all. We want to be entertained. We want to be told what to do. We want someone else to tell us how to live, what this clarity is how to, what is truth, what is God, what is righteous behavior and so on. Now if one could discard completely all the authority of psychological specialists as well as the specialists in religion, if one could really deeply negate all authority of that kind, then one would be relying totally on oneself. Well, now I feel I may be right off. I'm contradicting what you're suggesting because my impulse, after you've said that it seems to you that it is possible to, ch to achieve this lucidity, my impulse is to ask you immediately, how? Richard. But you, you say, I, am I looking to authority? No, no. That? What is necessary is the freedom from authority, not the how. The how implies a method, a system, a way trodden by others and someone to tell you, do this and you will find. Now, are you saying with this that it's an inappropriate question to ask you 
how this lucidity is to be achieved? No, not at all, sir. But the how implies that. The how implies a method, and a system. And the moment you have a system and a method, you become mechanical. You just do what you're told. And that's not clarity. It's like a child uh, being told by its mother what it should do from morning till night. And therefore it becomes dependent on the mother, or the father, whatever it be, and there is no clarity. So, to have clarity, the first essential thing is freedom. Freedom from authority. And I feel in a kind of bind, because this freedom is attractive too, and I want to go towards that. But I also want to pick your mind and ask you uh, how to proceed. Am I uh, moving away from my freedom if I ask you how to proceed? No, sir. But um, I'm pointing out the difficulty of that word, the implication of that word, the how. how yes, yes. Not the one is wandering away from freedom or any other thing of that kind, but the word how implies intrinsically the a mind that says, please tell me what to do. And uh, I ask again, is that a mistaken question? Is that a wrong question? I should, should think that's a wrong question, wrong the half. Question. But rather if you say, <coughs> what are the things, the, the obstructions that prevent clarity, then we can go into it. But if you say right from the beginning there, please, what is the method? There have been dozen methods and they've all failed. <coughs> They have not produced clarity or enlightenment or a state of peace in man. On the contrary, these methods have divided man. You have your method and somebody else has his method and these methods are everlastingly quarreling with each other. Mm. Uh, are you saying that uh, once you abstract certain principles and formulate them into a method, this becomes too crude, That's right. the intricacies yeah. the of the intricacies and the complexities and the living quality of clarity. So that the how would, must always be immediate from where one stands, the particular individual? I, I would never put the how at all. The how should <laughs> never enter into the mind. Well, this is a hard teaching. Uh, it may be true and I'm reaching for it and yet I don't know that it's possible. I don't feel that it's possible completely to relinquish the question how in every sense. Sir, I think we'll, you will be, we'll be able to understand each other if we could go a little slowly, not into the how, but what are the things that prevent clarity? All right, fine. That's through fine. negation, through negation, come to clarity, not through the positive method of following a system. Fine. All right. This is the via negativa. Via negativa. Approach to the yeah. back door. That's yeah. good. Let's that, I think that's follow. the only way. All right. The positive way of the how has led man to, uh, to divide himself, his loyalties, his pursuits, you have the how of yours and the how of somebody else and the method of this and that, and they're all lost. Fine. So all right. if we could put aside that question, the how, for the time being, all right. and probably you'll never put it afterwards, right. and I hope you won't. Well, let's <laughs> see. Let's so what is important is to find out What are the obstructions, the hindrances, the blocks that prevent clear perception of human anxiety, fear, sorrow, 
and the ache of loneliness, the utter lack of love and all that. Good. Let's explore the virtues of that's negative. The, what, what, what are these obstacles? Now, first of all, I feel there must be freedom. Freedom from authority. Could we stop right there on this matter of authority? When you say we should renounce all authority, um, it seems to me that the goal of total freedom and self-reliance uh, is a valid one, and yet along the way it seems to me that we rely and should rely on all kinds of authorities in certain spheres. Uh, when I go to a new territory and I stop to ask the filling station attendant uh, which way to go, I accept his authority as knowing more about that than I do. And isn't this the obviously, way... Obviously, sir, obviously the specialist knows little more than the layman. The experts, either in surgery or in technological knowledge, they are obviously they know much more than any other person right. who is not concerned with that particular technique. But we are considering not authority along any particular line, but the whole problem of, of authority. And in that area is the answer to understand the areas in which there is specialized authority, which we should accept. We should accept. And where authority is things. detrimental. Yes. Authority is destructive. Right. So there are, uh, there are two problems involved in this uh, question of authority. There is not only the authority of the expert, let's call him for the moment, which is necessary, but also the authority of the man who, who says, psychologically, I know you don't. I see. So This is true, this is false. You must do this and you must not do that. So one should never turn over one's life to... To anybody. Anyone else. Because the churches throughout the world, very different religions, have said, give your life to us. We will direct it, we'll shape it, we'll tell you what to do. Do this, follow the Saviour, follow the Church, and you will have peace. But on the contrary, churches have produced terrible wars. Religions uh, of every kind have brought about fragmentation of the mind. So. The question is not freedom from a particular authority, mm -hmm. but the whole conceptual acceptance of authority. Yes, all right. I think I, I see that, and that one should never abdicate one's own right know, of no, conscience. No, no, I'm not talking of conscience. Our conscience is such a petty little affair. Well, maybe we're thinking about conscience, and I'm thinking about the conscience of how I should live my life. How no, I no sir, no. Life. We have started out to say, asking the question, why is it man who has lived for two million years and more, why is man not capable of clear perception and action? Yeah. That is the question involved. Right. And your first point is that it's because he doesn't accept the full responsibility. I don't say life. that. No, I, don't. I haven't come to that point yet. Uh, we, I'm saying that, there, as we said, we must approach this problem negatively, mm -hmm. which means that I must find out what are the blockages, the obstacles, yes. obstacles right. which prevent clear perception. Right. Now, one of the major blocks or hindrances is this total acceptance of authority. All right, fine. So be ye lamps unto yourself. That's this right. Is what so you said. must be a light to yourself. Very good. All and right. to be a light to yourself, you must deny every other light, which, however great that light be, whether it be the life of the light of the Buddha or X, Y, Z. Yeah, perhaps uh, accept it here or there, but nevertheless you retain 
the say so as to where I, an no, insight no. might be valid? And no, sir. I, no, no. Never accept the. Uh, My own authority. Have, what authority have I? My authority is the authority of the society. I am conditioned to accept authority. When I reject the authority of the outer, I accept the authority of the inner. And my, my authority of the inner is the result of the conditioning in which I have been brought up. All right, I thought I had this in place, and I guess perhaps I still do. Uh, the only point uh, that I'm not quite sure about at this point is, it seems to me, while assuming, accepting, affirming, and maintaining one's own uh, freedom... Are you can't... Sir, That's wrong. how can a prisoner accept ideologically or theoretically, accept he is free? He is in prison. And that is the fact from which we must move, I see. not right. accept a vague, fantastic, ideological freedom which doesn't exist. Okay. What exists is that man has bound to this total authority. All right, and this is the the first thing that we Absolutely. must see and must uh, remove. Or rise completely, above. that must go for a man who is serious, who wants to find out the truth or see things very clearly. All right. Fine. Now, now an another? You were that is one of the major points. And the demand of freedom, not only from authority, but the demand from fear, All right. which this makes him accept authority. Right. That seems, uh, seems true also. And so beneath the craving for authority is, is fear. fear, which we yeah. look to authority That's right. to free. And so the fear makes man violent. Not only territorial violence, but sexual violence and different forms of violence. Yeah. All right. So, authority, the freedom from authority implies the freedom from fear. All right. And the freedom from fear implies the cessation of every form of violence. If we stop violence, then our ah. fear recedes? No, sir. It's not a question of recession of fear. Let's put it around the other way, sir. Man is violent. Linguistically, psychologically, in daily life he is violent, which ultimately leads to war. There's a lot of it around. That's and, that's, and man has accepted war as the way of life, whether in the office, whether at home, or in the playing field, or any way, war he has accepted as the way of life, which is the very essence of violence. Now, oh, and aggression are all that's involved. So, as long as man accepts violence, lives a way of life which is violent, he perpetuates fear, and therefore violence, and also accepts authority. So these three are a kind of vicious, vicious circle, circle, each playing into the other. Uh, all and right. the churches say, be, live peaceful, be kind, and love your neighbor, which is all sheer nonsense. They don't mean it. They merely have verbal assertion. That has no meaning at all. It's just an idea, because the morality of society, which is the morality of the church, is immoral. As we try to see then these things that uh, stand between us and lucidity and freedom, we find the authority and uh, fear and violence working uh, together to obstruct us. Where do we go from there? It's not going to some place, uh, but it's 
understanding this fact that most of us live a life in this ambiance, in this, in this cage of authority, fear and violence. We can't go beyond it unless one is free from it, not intellectually or uh, theoretically, but actually be free from every form of authority. Not the authority of the expert, but the, the feeling of dependence on authority. All right. All right. I think I... That. Then, is it possible for a human being to be free completely of fear, not only at the superficial level of one's consciousness, but also at the deeper level, what's called the unconscious. Okay. Is it possible? That's the, otherwise you are bound to accept authority of anybody, mm -hmm. any Tom, Dick and Harry with a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of cunning explanation or intellectual formulas, you are bound to fall for him. Mm -hmm. But the question whether a human being so heavily conditioned as he is through propaganda of the church, through propaganda of society, morality and all the rest of it, whether such a human being can really be free from fear. That is the basic question, sir. That's what I wait to hear. And no. can he? I say it is possible. Not in abstraction, but actually it is possible. All right, and my impulse again is to say how. And the <laughs> refrain, refrain, so yeah, you see, when you say how, you stop to learn. All right. You cease to learn. All right, uh, let's just forget that, that I said that, I, because I don't I, want to get no, distracted. No, you can never even ask that, ever. Because we are learning. Learning about the nature and the structure of human fear at the, at the deepest level and also at the most superficial level. And we are learning about it. And when you are learning, you can't, you can't tell, you can't ask suddenly, how am I to learn? There is no how, if you are interested, if the, if the problem is vitally intense, uh, it has to be solved to live peacefully. There is no how. You say, let's learn about it. All right. All right. So the moment you bring in the how, you, you move away from the central fact of learning. All right, that's fine. Let's that, continue that, on the shaft of right. learning about, uh, about this. So, what does it mean to learn? Are you asking me? Yes, obviously. What does it mean to learn? Uh, it means to perceive how one should proceed in a given domain. No, sir. Surely. Here is a problem of fear. I want to learn about it. I, first of all, I mustn't condemn it. I mustn't say uh, it's terrible and run away from it. Yeah, it sounds to me like you've been condemning it in I don't, one way or another. I don't. I want to learn. When I want to learn about something, I look. There's no condemnation at all. Well, uh, we were going at this through a negative route which is, to see Which is what I'm doing. And fear is an obstacle. Which I'm l about which I'm going to learn. I therefore I can't condemn it. Well, it's not good. You're not advocating it. Oh, no. I'm neither advocating or not. A, here is a fact of fear. I want to learn about it. Moment I learn about something, I'm free of it. So learning matters. Yeah. What is the <clears throat> what is implied in learning? What is implied in learning? First of all, to learn about something, there must be complete cessation of condemnation or justification. 
All right. Uh, yes, I can see that. If we're going to understand something, if we keep our emotions out of it and just try to dispassionately... Uh, to learn. It's <laughs> you're putting... You're introducing words like dispassion. Huh? That's unnecessary. If I want to learn about that camera, I begin to look at it, undo it, go into it. There's not a question of dispassion or passion. I want to learn. So I want to learn about this question of fear. Okay. So I, to learn, I must, there must be no condemnation, no justification of fear, and therefore no escape verbally from the fact of fear. Right. Hmm? But the tendency is to deny it. To deny the reality of The fear. reality of fear. The reality that fear is causing all these things. To deny by saying, I must develop courage. So, please, we are going into this problem of fear, because it's really a very important question whether human mind can ever be free of fear. It certainly is. Which means whether the mind is capable of looking at fear, looking, mm -hmm. not in abstraction, but actually at fear as it occurs. Facing fear. Facing fear. Right. All right, no. we should do this, and I agree with you. No, we can't to look, deny to face it. it, no condemnation. All right. No justification. Simply being aware, truly objective. Aware of fear. Acknowledging. And not a, the, I don't acknowledge it. There is the camera there. I don't acknowledge it. It is there. All right, I, I don't want to distract uh, our line that's of why, thought please, with these uh, words. That's why I'm, I'm be, one has to be awfully careful of words, because the word is not the thing, therefore I don't want to move away from this. So, to learn about fear, there must be no condemnation or justification. All right. That's a fact. Then, my mind can, the mind can look at fear. What is fear? That every kind of fear, hmm? fear of darkness, fear of the wife, fear of the husband, fear of war, fear of storm, fear of uh, so many psychological fears. Hmm? Mm -hmm. And you, you cannot possibly have the time to analyze all the fears. That would take the whole lifetime, by then you have not even understood any fear. Right. So it's the phenomenon of fear itself, rather that than any specific... Any particular fear. Right. Hmm? Now, what should we learn... Wait, I'm going to show you, sir. Go slow. Now, to learn about something, you must be in com complete contact with it. I want to... Look, look sir. I want to learn about fear. Hmm? Hmm. Therefore, I must look at it. I must face it. Yes. Now, to face something implies a mind that is... that does not want to solve the problem of fear. To look at fear... Is not to solve the problem of fear. Now, I'm I have really itself, look, look, this is very important to understand, because then if I want to solve fear, I'm more concerned with the solution of fear than facing fear. A moment ago, though, we were saying we should face... I am facing it, but if I say I must solve it, I am beyond it already. I am not looking. You say that if we're trying to solve the problem of fear, then we're not truly facing it. Is that right? Quite right, sir. You see, to face fear, Mind must be completely 
must give its complete attention to fear. And that if you give partial attention, which is say, well, I want to solve it and go beyond it, you're not giving complete attention. I, I can see that if you have a split attention yeah, of course, of while course. you're not That's fully attentive. So, to, in giving complete attention to the learning about fear, there are several problems involved in it. I must be brief because our time is limited. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we generally consider fear as something outside us. Mm -hmm. So there is this question of the observer and the observed. Right. The observer says, I am afraid, and he puts fear something away from me. I'm not sure that that's true. When I feel afraid, I am afraid. I, I feel it's very much in here. Yes, in here. But when, you ob may be a but when you observe it, it is different. When I observe fear, fear then, then I tend to put it out. Put it to outside. Well, again, that doesn't seem quite right because it's certainly so fear, even the, when I'm well, thinking right. of it. At the moment of fear, mm -hmm. hmm, there is neither the observer nor That's the true. observer. That is very true. That's what I'm yes. saying. At the crisis, at the moment of actual fear, the there is neither the observer. There is no observer. It fills the it, horizon. It, there, no. The moment you begin to look at it, face it, there is this division. Mm. Uh, between the fearful self and the... Non-fearful uh, The self. bear who's going yeah, to eat, eat me out yeah. there. So, it's, there it yeah. is. Right. So, in trying to learn about fear, there is the, this division between the observer and the observed. Mm. Now, is it possible to look at fear without the observer? Don't, please sir, this is really quite uh, intricate question and complex ahead, question go that's going to go, one has to go into very deep play. Yeah. As long as there is the observer who is going to learn about the fear, there is a division. That's true. We're not in full contact, contact. with it. That's true. Therefore, in that division is the conflict of trying to get rid of fear, justify fear. So, is it possible to look at fear without the observer? So that you are completely in contact with it all the time. Well, then As you're experiencing fear. I wouldn't like to use that word experience because experience implies going through something, well. finishing with it. All right. I don't know what word you... It seems better than looking at, because looking at does seem to Therefore, imply a distinction between observer and observer. We are, we are using that word, observing. Mm -hmm. Being aware of fear without choice, which means the choice implies the observer, choosing whether I don't like this, I like this. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he, the observer... Is ab when the observer is absent, there is choiceless awareness of fear. All right. Hmm? All right. right. All right. Then what takes place? That's Not the whole sure. question. All right. The observer is the is the creates the linguistic difference between himself and the thing observed. Language comes in there. Therefore, the, the word prevents being completely in contact with fear. Yes, yeah. words can be a screen. Yes, screening that's, all, us. That, that's all what we are saying. All right. So the, the word mustn't interfere. True, all right. We have to get beyond that. Beyond the word. Right. But is that possible to be beyond the word? Theoretically we say yes, but the, we are slave to it. Far too much so, yeah. yes. I mean, it's true. obvious, we are slave to it. Right. So, the mind has to become aware of its own slavery to word, realizing that the word is never the thing. Right. So, the mind is free of the word to look. Right. That's all implied. So, look, I want to understand, I mean, 
the relationship between two people, husband and wife, is the relationship between of images. Um, obviously, obviously. I mean, right. There is no dispute about it. Right. Hmm? You have your image and yeah. she has her image about you. The relationship is between these two images. Now, the real relationship, human relationship is when the images don't exist. In the same way, the relationship between the observer and the observed hmm, ceases when the world is not. Yes, that brings So, he is directly in contact with fear. Right. Hmm? We pass through the through. screen. There, there it is. There is fear. Yes. Now, there is fear at the conscious level, which is fairly under, one can understand fairly quickly. Hmm? But there are the deeper layers of fear, hmm? so called at the hidden um, parts of the mind, yes. hmm? to be aware of that. Right. Now, that means, is it possible to be aware without analysis? Analysis takes time. Right. Surely it's possible. How? Not the how of method. You said surely it's possible. Is it? There is this whole reservoir of fear, hmm? of the fear of the race, fear of the whole content of the unconscious. The content is the unconscious. All right. Hmm? All right. Now, to be aware of all that, which means not through dreams. Again, that takes too long. Now you're talking about whether we can be uh, explicitly aware of the full reach of mind. Yes, full content reach of the mind which is both the conscious as well as the deeper layers. The totality of consciousness. Yes, and can we be explicitly aware yes. of all of that? Of all of that. I'm not sure. I say it is possible. It is only possible when you are aware during the day what you say, what you, the words you use, the gestures, the, the way you talk, the way you walk, the, what your thoughts are, to be completely and totally aware of all that. Do you think all of that can be yes, before sir. you in total, total awareness? Absolutely. When there is no condemnation and justification when you are directly in contact with it. It seems to me that the mind is sort of like an iceberg with no. regions is it, of it. The it iceberg is nine-tenths below and one-tenth above. Uh, it is possible to see the whole of it. The during the day, aware. during the day if you are aware of your thoughts, of your feelings, of your aware of the motives, all which demands a mind that's highly sensitive. Well, we can certainly be aware of much, much more than we usually are. Uh, but when you say we can be aware totally. of all the yes, sir, psychological I am factors... Sure, I am, I'm showing play. you. I'm showing you. You're denying it. <laughs> you say it's not possible. Then it's not possible. No, I'd like to believe this. I know. Possible. It's not a question of belief. I, no. I don't have to believe in what I see. It's only when I don't see I believe in God, this or that. Yeah, when you are, for me when you it's see. a matter of belief, maybe not for and you. No, you the belief are. is the most destructive dip for part of life. Why should I believe the sun rises? I see it sunrise. I believe, so when I do not know how, what love is, then I believe in love. Like so many times in, when I listen to you speak, it seems to me like uh, a, a half-truth which is stated as a full truth, and I wonder whether that's for the sake of emphasis, no, or sir. whether it really is. It you really, really need to, me to carry it, really, it all the way. To me it really is. We've been speaking of the elements that block us, the things that block us from a life of lucidity and freedom, uh, authority, violence, fear. Uh, our time is short and I 
wouldn't like to spend all the time on these obstacles. Is there anything affirmative we can say about this condition? So anything affirmative indicates authority. It's only the authoritarian mind that says, let's be affirmed. Now, um, which is in opposition to negation. But the negation we are talking about has no opposite. Well now, uh, when I ask you for an affirmative statement, it doesn't seem to me that I'm turning over a decision to you as an authority. No. I just want to hear if you have something interesting to say, which I will then stand judgment upon. With regard to what, whether sir? It's, whether with it's with sounds, regard to what? As to whether it speaks to my condition. W what? With regard to what? You said something... About... Pardon? What? About what? Yes, about uh, the state of life that it seems to me we're groping for in our words to describe. Now, are you trying to say, sir, that Life is only in the present. In one sense, I think that's true. Right. Is that what you're Are you you're trying saying? to... I'm, no, I'm asking you. Is this what you're asking? Is life to be divided into the past, present and future, which becomes fragmentary, mm -hmm. and not a total perception of living? Well, again, as so often, it seems to me that the answer is both and. In one sense, it is a unity and it is present and the present is all we have. But man is a time-binding animal, as they say, he is, he who is can time look by before his, and yes, after. So, he, man is the result of time. Yes. Not only evolutionary, but chronological as well as psychological. Yes. yes. So, so this, he is the result of time, the past, present and the future. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Now, he lives mostly in the past. All right, mostly. Uh, he is the past. All right, uh, again, it's uh, that no, 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 true. no, no, I'll show it to you, I'll show it to you. He is the past, because he lives in memory. Not totally. No, wait, so follow it step by step. He lives in the past and therefore he thinks and examines and looks from the background of the past. Yes. Which is both good and... Ah, no, no, I'm not, we're not saying good and bad. Right. There's no good okay. bad and ba bad past. We are he concerned does. with the past. Yes. Don't mm, give it a name. All right. By calling it good or bad, then we're lost. All right. He lives in the past, examines everything from the past and projects the future from the past. Yes. So, he lives in the past. He is the past. And when he thinks of the future or the present, he thinks in terms of the past. All right. Uh, you see, it seems to me that most of the time that is true, but there are new perceptions, there are breakthroughs, ah, there are new sir. experiences that break through um, the new momentum of the past. New experiences break through only when, they, when there is an absence of the past. Well, it seems to me like it's a merging of things that we perforce bring with us from the past, but bring to play upon the novel of uh, novelty, sir, the newness of the present, and it's a fusion of those two. Look, sir, if I want to understand something new, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I must look at it with clear eyes. Yes. I can't bring the past with all the recognition process, with all the memories, and then translate what I see as new. Surely, surely, suggest me. The man who invented the jet mm, must have forgotten or be completely familiar with the propeller mm -hmm. piston. Right. Right. And then there was an absence of knowledge in which he discovered the new. That's fine. Wait, wait, and, 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 no, not question. That's fine. It is. That's the only way to operate in life. Yes. That is. I must be 
completely aware of, there must be complete awareness of the past. Yes. And absence of the past to see the new. All right. Or to come upon the new. All right. <laughs> not, you're conceding reluctantly. That's not <laughs> I'm, I'm conceding reluctantly because uh, I think I see what you're saying and I think I agree with the point that you're making, but it's also true that uh, one operates in terms of, of the past. symbols that South one the past. has, and you can't, it's not as though we begin uh, de novo, no, de novo like is not possible. Rasa. But we have to begin de novo because the life demands it, because we have lived in this way, to accepting war, hatred, brutality, competition, and anxiety, guilt, all that is a... we have accepted that. We live that way. And we, I am saying, to bring about a different quality, a different way of living, the past must disappear. We must be open to the new. Yeah. Therefore, Absolutely. the past must have no meaning. Uh, that I can't uh, go well, along uh, with. That's a, <laughs> that, that is what the whole world is object. The established order says, I can't let go for the new to be. And the young people all throughout the world say, let's revolt against the old. But they don't understand the whole complications of it. Because they say, but what have you given us? except examinations, job, and the repetition of the old pattern. War, and favorite wars, mm, wars. Well, you're pointing out, it seems to me, the importance of not being slaves to the past. The, and that's the, so true, and I don't want to, uh, to in any way... Past being the tradition, past being the pattern of morality, yes. which is the social morality, which is not moral, but at the same time, there's only one generation, namely ourselves, that separates the future generation from the caveman. And yeah. if what I agree all that. I, that's brought what, that's, were to be totally rescinded, that's then also, we would start right now. Uh, no, no, no. To, to, to break through the past uh, demands a great deal of intelligence, mm. a great deal of sensitivity right. to the past. Yeah. You can't but, just break away from it. Okay. I'm content, that's all. All right. So, the problem really, sir, is can we live a different way? Here, here. Hmm? Right. A different way in which there are no wars, no hatreds, in which man loves man without competition, without division. We say, you are a Christian, you are a Catholic, you are a Protestant, you are this. That's also immature. There's no meaning. Mm. Well, it's an intellectual, sophisticated division. And that's not a religious mind at all. That's not religion. A, re a religious mind is a mind that has no hatred that lives completely without fear, without anxiety, in which there is not a particle of antagonism. Therefore, that a mind that loves, that's a, a different dimension of living altogether. And nobody wants that. And in another sense, everybody wants that. But they won't, they won't go after it. They won't go after oh, No, of course not. They are distracted by so many other things. They are so heavily conditioned by their past, they hold on to it. Well, I think there's some who uh, will go after it. are very few. The numbers doesn't The minority, so which the minority is always the most important thing. Krishnamurti, as I listen to you and try to listen through the words to what you're saying, it seems to me that what I hear is uh, first that uh, I should work out and each of us should work out his own salvation, not leaning on authorities outside. Uh, second, not to be, not to allow uh, words to form a film between us and actual experience, not to mistake the menu for the meal. And third, not to let the past uh, 
swallow up the present, take possession through uh, responding to it through conditionings from the past, but rather to be always open uh, to the new, the novel, the fresh. And uh, finally, uh, it seems to me you're, you're saying something like the key to doing this is a radical reversal in our point of view. It's as though we were prisoners uh, straining at the bars for the light that, and looking for the glimpse of light we see out there and wondering how we could get out towards it while actually the door of the cell is open behind us. If only we would turn around, we could walk out into freedom. This is what it sounds to me like you're saying. Is this... A little bit, sir, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, what else? What, uh, what other than that? Or if you want to amplify. So, surely, sir, this day in this is involved the everlasting struggle, conflict, man caught in his own conditioning yes. and straining, struggling, beating his head to be free. Yes. So, and again, we have accepted with the help of religions and all the rest of the group, that effort is necessary. That's part of life. Uh, that's, uh, to me, that is the highest form of blindness, of limiting man to say, you must everlastingly live mm. in effort. And you think we don't have to? Not I think. It, it is... So it's not a question of thought. Thought is the most... Uh, uh, let's delete those two words and just say we don't have to. But to live without effort requires the greatest sensitivity and the highest form of intelligence. You don't just say, well, I won't struggle and become like a cow. Right. Right. But one has to understand the hoax conflict arises the duality in us, yes. the, the fact of what is and what should be, there is the conflict. Mm. If there is no what should be, which is ideological, which is um, non-real, which is fictional, and see what is, and face it, live with it, without the what is, what should be, then there is no conflict at all. It's only when you compare, evaluate with what should be, and then look with what should be, with the what is, then conflict arises. There should be no tension between the ideal and the actual? No ideal at all. Why should we have an ideal? The ideal is the most idiotic form of uh, conceptual thinking. Why should I have an ideal? When the fact is burning there, why should I have an ideal about anything? Well, now, once more, when you speak like that, it seems to me you break it into an either-or. No, no, Not no. the ideal, but the actual, whereas it seems to me the truth is somehow ah, both of these no, must be No, truth is not a mixture of the ideal and the what is, then you produce some melange of some dirt. There is only what is. Why should, sir, look, take a very simple example. We human beings are violent. Why should I have an ideal of non-violence? Why can't I deal with the fact? Of violence? Of violence, without non-violence. The, the uh, ideal is an abstraction, is a, is a distraction. The fact is I am violent, man is violent. Let's tackle that. Let's come to grips with that and see if we can't live Without one. Yes, but then... <laughs> ah, there is no... Please, sir, there is no dualistic process in this. There is only the fact that I am violent. Man is violent. And is it possible to be free of that? Why should I introduce the idealistic nonsense into it? 
you're no dualism you say no separation and in your view is this the case that there is no separation absolutely there is here do you feel any separate is there any separation you me i said wait physically there is yes. you have got a black suit or a fairer person than me but and you so don't feel I, if i felt a dualistic i wouldn't even sit down to discuss it because I, then we would be intellectually we play with each other right now perhaps we're saying the same thing but it always it comes out in my mind is a both and we are both separate and we are united so both. when you love both. somebody with your heart not with your mind do you feel separate i do in some it's both i feel I both separate and together then it's not love i wonder because love uh, part so of the joy of love is the relationship which involves in some sense like ramakrishna said uh, i don't want to be sugar i, I don't know sugar. i don't know ramakrishna i don't want to know any authority i don't want to quote any bird don't get hung up on no i am i have so no i am i am dealing uh, i am we are dealing with facts not what somebody said the fact right. is that in love there is the part of the beauty and glory of it is the sense of unity embracing what in certain respects is separate so that just means let's be little less be much more right. unromantic about it <laughs> <laughs> the fact is when there is love between man and woman in that is involved possession domination hmm? Uh, authority, some. jealousy, all that's involved in it. There's some of that. Of course, there is, and comfort, sexual pleasure, mm -hmm. mm, and the remembrance of all. So it's all that. It's a bundle of all that. Mm? And there's some positive things yes, yes, left out, but, but bundle of all that. Those. And do I? Is love jealousy? Is love pleasure? Is love desire? if it is pleasure is merely the activity of thought say well i slept with that woman therefore I, she is mine and the remembrance of all that that's not love thought is not love thought breeds fear thought breeds pain thought breeds pleasure and pleasure is not love thought breeds only negative Uh, what is the positive which is uh, what is the positive thing that thought produces except mechanical things a love poem uh, so love poem what the man feels something and puts it down yes the putting down is irrelevant merely a form of communication hmm? but to feel it is nothing to do with thought to translate it then is necessary for thought but to love my the thought and words can also give form to our feelings which would remain in coate without so them have now is there bring them to resolution to satisfying is, resolution is relation, to their expression is relationship a matter of thought not only but thought can contribute to a relationship thought is always the old relationship is something new yes but there are new thoughts ah, there is no such thing as new thought uh, 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 forgive uh, me to be so emphatic no, I, but i like that i don't think there is a new thought there is no thought in free thought can never be free because thought is the response of memory thought a, is the response when of a great the boss. poem come a poet comes through with a with the right words to articulate a new perception that nobody is, has before not even god has thought of those particular words that is me a matter of a cunning gift of putting words together but what we are talking it's about noble trait and like the minor gift. minor Poetry thing is a great concept no so that's a minor thing the major thing is to see the beauty of life True. and to see the immensity of it the glow the and to love and to love there it ended 
a conversation with Krishnamurti. But what ended was only the words, not the substance, for Krishnamurti was speaking as always of that life that has no end and no beginning. I am Houston Smith, Professor of Philosophy at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and I invite you to a conversation arranged by the Blaisdell Institute of Claremont, California, with Krishnamurti, who was raised by Annie Besant and the Theosophist to be a world teacher, and who, though he discarded the mantle of Theosophy, did indeed become a sage of our century one whose voice is heard as much by the youth of today as throughout the world for the last 60 years. <laughs> 